Hello everyone and welcome to The Bible Study. We are a multicultural group of believers that serve and emulate the Lord Jesus Christ. Now come journey with us as we go step by step on this journey through the Word of God in order to study to show ourselves approved, rightfully dividing the Word of Truth. We now join in with today's lesson entitled, It Is Finished. There's more than what meets the eye. Okay, we're going to go ahead and begin. I uh, would like to take this opportunity to welcome everyone, especially begin by saying Happy Easter to each and every one of you. Uh, Jesus is risen and Jesus is Lord. So, hey, we're going to uh, begin today. We're going to uh, open up with a word of prayer by Sister Shade, and we're going to have our welcome to all of you by Sister Amanda. All right, let's go ahead with that then. All right. Good morning, everyone. Let's begin in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for gathering us all here this morning or afternoon for some. Um, I just thank you for, you know, saving all of us. Um, this day is a very important day. Um, it's a very important day in history and even in today's um time. Lord, I just pray that you just bless everybody through this um, Bible study today that we understand um, why you did die for all of our sins, why you, um, you know, rose back up. If we are questioning it, I just pray that all of those questions be answered. Um, Lord, you can do work miracles. Um, you are a living proof of a miracle. So Lord, I just thank you in Jesus name. I pray. Amen. 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 Good morning, everybody. Um, Good morning. I am Amanda, our sister Amanda. I am part of the hospitality department. Um, I'm just so thankful to be here and be here with all of you. Um, Resurrection Sunday, what an amazing, amazing day. And like she had said, it's a day of history, right? So um, today, Pastor Scott is going to be talking on Resurrection Sunday, the day that time itself started. Um, over as zero AD. Um, let's see here. If you guys aren't in the Facebook group, um, please ask somebody to get in there. It's kind of, it's been fun and I've gotten to answer some questions right away. Um, <laughs> it's, you know, personal achievement, yay. Um, so anyway, um, just super thankful to have you all here. Um, and yeah, I hope you're all blessed by the word today. Amen. Amen. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you so very much for that welcoming. And like Sister Amanda said, um, we do have a Facebook group, actual um, uh, a group that we actually come together. Um, we discuss the things that are taught on Sunday morning and things that are learned on that actual and with the teaching that we do today. So it's a really great group. They have great questions, great conversations, and just a, a great fellowship. So I have a special treat for all of you and myself today. And what you all don't know, the Bible says this, know them that labor among you. And one thing that I know about one of these wonderful people is that we have a song bird <laughs> among us and she has a voice. Now, if you talk to her, you will never know by her voice that she can sing so well. But without any further ado, I want to turn this little portion over because we're going to hear a, a actual little bit of amazing grace by an amazing person named other none other than Sister Mary Carrington. <laughs> oh, Sister Mary is My, What a buildup. Holy smoke, Lord, may I live up to those wonderful <laughs> words. Join with me in prayer. Yes. Amazing grace. Yes. How sweet the sound it saved a wretch like me Wow. 
song was blind but now I see amen 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 wonderful 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 my pleasure my pleasure thank you so very much uh just Nobody you got know sick, I hope. <laughs> please <laughs> You better mute yourself. I see you talkative today. <laughs> yeah. Listen, we're so excited uh, for the word of God. And we really want to thank God for uh, Sister Carrington, Mary Carrington, singing that beautiful uh, song, Amazing Grace. And it is so uh, well-timed uh, today because as we do uh, talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, uh, it was only by an amazing grace. And um, when we think about the word grace, we think about that's God's unmerited favor towards us. But this was amazing grace, which is even greater than that. And so uh, today, I want you all, uh, as was mentioned, um, keep me in prayer because I'm going to teach this uh, message and I feel like God has given it to me this way that I'll teach it today. And this will not need, be your traditional um, Resurrection Sunday message because there are a lot of things that took place and transpired uh, during this resurrection time uh, in Jesus' life. And some of the things um, we don't talk about because a lot of it we don't know. And so I have this little thought and it came to me while Sister Mary was singing this song and the thought is called, it's more than what meets the eyes. It's more than what meets the eyes. So this morning, I want to talk about, first of all, I'll start with uh, the blueprint. Um, a blueprint is very important on any structure of any building. Whatever you're building, you need to have a blueprint because that blueprint is so vitally important. So let me let me just open up just for a second. And I'll be asking just a few of you some questions, but again, uh, try not to be long on it because I got a lot I got to cover, but just, just some little questions. I got a prophetess prince, I see you here. Hey, what, what would you say is the purpose of having a blueprint, a blueprint? Um, a blueprint is, I think for when I think of a blueprint, I think about the importance of knowing having the total instructions mm -hmm. <laughs> um, because you don't want to wing it when you're building a building. I think in terms of a building, when you're building a building, you don't want to wing mm -hmm. just, oh, let me just put this panel here because it right. may not uphold where it should. It might not hold the structure as mm -hmm. it should. So a blueprint alleviates guessing. That's right. <laughs> And it gives precision, so yeah. Thank you so very much. And you're absolutely right. A blueprint gives clear and concise um, details of whatever that is that you're building or trying to have build so that you don't have to just do guesswork. How many times have you been involved and you've seen people that instead of having it written out and, and diagrammed out step by step, they're coming off of there, as they say, cuff, and then they leave something out. It happens all the times. Haven't you had times when you were getting ready, maybe you go in your house or you, you got ready to put on your glasses or whatever. You're saying, what did I do? What did I do with those glasses? I was looking for them and you're looking all around, looking in the living room, looking in the bedroom, looking in the bathroom. I can't find these glasses. I, I got to see. And they're right there on your head. And you say, Oh my God, I've had times when I was looking for something and I, I got my keys in my hand and I can't find my keys. And I'm like, I know I should have my keys because I can't get in the house without my, they're right in my hand. And so there are times that there will be things that will be in plain sight, but yet they won't be able to be seen by our natural I because our mind is so distracted with trying to find it because we're panicking, it could be right there in plain sight. Well, I want you to know 
uh, that goes right into what I'm going to teach on today. And it's just going to be three words. It is finished. It is finished. It is very important that in anything that we do, anything we involve ourselves with, anyone that we involve ourselves with, that if we're going to do anything, the Bible says it like this, how can two walk together except they agree? And if you're going to be agreeing on anything, you have to be able to say, I want to be in this until I have completed whatever that journey or whatever that theme is that you're trying to accomplish. Well, I want you to know this. There was more to Jesus when we talk about his resurrection, when we talk about his crucifixion, when we talk about his life, than what meets the eye. I want you to know this. And typically, on a Sunday morning message, we hear about Jesus having to, as we do know, he came to seek to save that which was lost because we all were born in sin. The Bible says shaping in iniquity. The Bible says that even in our mother's womb, we were conceived in sin, not because of what we did, but because of what Adam and Eve did, because Adam represented all mankind. And when he sinned, we all were born into sin. So there was nothing we could do about that. Everyone born after the similitude of woman was born in the sin, and we needed a savior. Why? Because everyone who did not have, who had not been able to accept Jesus as their savior, as a sinner, they knew they were going to go to this place called hell. We need to be saved from the penalty of hell. And who came? Jesus came as a sacrifice for sin, and because he was our sacrifice, because he lived a life that was godly and proven to God, then he was able to be our substitute and come for us and be able to live a life pleasing to God, which was able to forgive us of sin, but he had to give his life. The only thing I want you to do uh, today is be able to understand it was still more than him just giving his life. So if you will, if you don't mind, come with me. Uh, let's turn our Bibles open to John 19, the 19th chapter and verse 30. St. John, the 19th chapter and verse 30. St. John, the 19th chapter and verse 30. All right, and let me just read what it says here at verse number 30. And the Bible says, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. In other words, he died. Jesus said this, it is finished, right after he received the vinegar. When Jesus said, it is finished, it is not that he was saying, um, it's finished, I'm about to die now, um, and, 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 and when, I'm, when I'm dead, you know, I'm going to re resurrect. To say it is finished, the first thing that comes to my mind, because let me just say this real quick, one of the hardest things to do when it comes to teaching the word of God is to teach familiar scriptures. And the reason why it's so hard and difficult is that most people, when they've heard these scriptures before over and over again, we build this uh, understanding that we already know about it. I know this story like the back of my hand. He he's can't tell me anything new. But I want to assure you, if you don't mind, I want you to be able to empty your cup of what you have already heard about what Jesus meant when it is finished. Empty your cup means just empty yourself, empty your mind of all the things you've already perceived that you already know about this story and allow God to give you some more increase to it because you'll find out it was more than what we think. 
Now I'm getting ready to go through a litany of what Jesus meant when he said it is finished. So you'll be able to understand clearly what he meant by it is finished. Okay. It is finished is referring to Jesus, the Bible says this, and this is in Matthew 5 and 17. Jesus said, I did not come to destroy the law. I came to fulfill the law. I came to fulfill what was said in the law of the prophets. Jesus realized that in order for him to become our savior, he had to fulfill every single thing that was written about him in the word of God. Every single thing. Now, imagine this. If he had left out one thing that was written about him that he had to fulfill, which means he had to complete, he had to do, he had to accomplish, he would not have been the savior. The Bible says that the Old Testament is a shadow of better things to come. Everything that was written in the Old Testament pointed to Jesus. Every single line, every single scripture, every single verse, every single chapter, every single book pointed to Jesus. Now, remember this. We are saved because we look back to the cross. We look back to what he did and how he rose from us. That saved us. But in the Old Testament, they had to look forward to the Messiah coming, forward to the cross, forward that there was going to be a son of God that was going to come and he would be the savior of the world. And that's what saved them by faith. Well, I want you to know that our salvation, not only was it not cheap, but it was very intricate. It was very detailed how these things must go. Let me ask you a question. And here's just another question. It's going to be a real easy question, but I just want you to be able to answer the question. Uh, got my friend here, Sister Latanya. Sister Latanya Montgomery. Let me ask you this here. What is easier to build? A actual two-stick house with two sticks or a Gold watch, which is easier to build. You have to under, yeah. I think it would be easier to build the two stick. The two yeah. stick. Yeah. yeah, because all you're doing is putting one stick on top of the other stick. Very simple, no problem. Okay, thank you. You can mute yourself now. So yes, yeah. it actually is easier to build some with two sticks. And I know that's a very easy question, but I want you to know this. Uh, it's very important that we understand that certain things cost more and it takes more detail. Uh, Sister Tan Tanya, if you heard a person went to, is going to court and they were fined $25, what would you think they probably did? Their fine was $25, that's it. I mean, maybe... Failed. I, geez, I don't know. I feel like that's so cheap. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I would say maybe jaywalking or. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they jaywalk something real simple. Okay, Brother Dion, suppose the person right behind that person, they find them $2 million. What kind of, th what kind of crime do you think they would have done? Probably this mass murder. <laughs> I'm telling you. It is. It had to be something, it, it mass murder. What I want you to know this, it took, the, for us to have our penalties paid, it took the son of God to pay this cost for us. It was not the blood, as the Bible said, the blood of bulls or heifers or, or doves or lambs. No, it took the precious blood of Jesus to pay for our penalty. And not only did he have to pay for our penalty, but he had to make sure that he did every single thing. Because you do know when they find you, when you're in court and you get fined, they tell you there's a penalty. You may have to pay cash, but there's some other things. They may put you on probation and other things too. Well, this thing here is the sins that were committed by our forefathers 
uh, were so bad that Jesus had not only to come and give his life as the savior of the world, but he had to do every single thing that was written. So let me go through some things. What was written that he had to do? And then what was the fulfillment of that? And because every single thing, we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of things. Now, he had to know what the word of God said that he had to fulfill also. That's the other part of it. There was not one part of the Bible, not one part of the word that he could overlook and not know. And this is why we stress the memory verse so very much so that we will realize it's so important. We cannot afford to miss any part of it. Old Testament. The Bible says this, that Jesus will come. He had to be born of the seed of woman. The Messiah had to be come and be born the seed of a woman. That was in Genesis, the third chapter, verse number 15. In the New Testament, the Bible says this in Galatians 4 and 4, that Jesus was born, obviously, of a woman. We find that in Matthew, the first chapter also, that Jesus was born. Matthew, Mark, and Luke show that he was born of a actual woman, which was Mary, which shows that he had to do that and fulfill the scripture. Part two, you probably won't be able to write all these scriptures, but if you can, God bless you. Uh, you'll be able to get this tape though, I'll say that. Uh, he would be born of a virgin. And we do know that's, uh, that is what we consider an impossibility. But the Bible says this, it was prophesied in Isaiah 7 and 14 that he would be born of a virgin in Micaiah, five and three, that he would be born of a virgin, but we find a fulfillment in Matthew 1 and 23 that Jesus was born of a virgin in Luke 1 and 26 through 35 that Jesus was also born of a woman. He had to fulfill this, not just a woman, but of a virgin. And that's why the Bible says when Mary conceived Jesus, she was a virgin. She fulfilled what was prophesied in the Old Testament, and it had to be fulfilled by Jesus. Next thing, he would be born as a descendant of Shem. That was in Genesis 9 and 27. Shem was one of the three sons of Noah. And then Jesus had to come out of that lineage. Now, this is so very important that you understand this, is that Jesus, this is why the Bible talks about, and this person begat this person, and this person begat this person. And the reason why is because the entire Bible, from the Old Testament all the way to the birth of Christ, traces Jesus' bloodline. It does not trace every person who was ever born on the face of the earth. It simply traces Jesus' bloodline because Jesus had to fulfill everything that was prophesied of the actual prophets of old. And they said he had to come out of the bloodline of Shem. So this is how we know he became out of the bloodline of Shem, according to Genesis 3 and 15. In Galatians 4 and 4, it identifies that Jesus did come out of the bloodline of Shem, which was one of the sons of Noah. Revelations 12 and 5 also identifies that Jesus was born out of that same generation, out of the same ancestry of Shem, the son of Noah. It said that not only that, he would be a descendant of Abraham. And we do know Abraham was considered the father of faith. And so Abraham, this was prophesied in Genesis 12 and three, and also it was prophesied in Genesis 18 and 18 that his seed would be as the seed or the sands of the earth, and Jesus was that seed that came out of the lineage of Abraham. The fulfillment of that was identified in the actual book of Matthew 1, 1 through 2, Luke 3, uh, verse 34, and Acts 3 and 25. Jesus, again, fulfilling the scripture because he cannot die. He cannot say it is finished if there was one thing left out, if there was one thing undone. Then we find out he was the seed of Isaac, Genesis 17 and 19, Genesis 21 and 12, that he would be as the, uh, in the lineage of Isaac. And not only that, we find a fulfillment of that in Matthew 1, 1 through 2, the book of Luke, the third chapter, verse 34, and the book of uh, Acts 3 and 25. He had to be of the lineage of Jacob. 
In Genesis 28 and 14, it said it prophesied that he would be of the seed of Jacob. In Numbers 24 and 17, he would also be of the seed of Jacob. The fulfillment of that was Luke 3 and 34 because we find out that Jesus in his lineage was the exact seed of Jacob. Not only that, he had to be of the seed of David. And we do know that God promised David that he would have a kingdom world without end and that the Messiah had to come from his seed. And so we find out that David's seed in Isaiah 9 and 7 was the Messiah. We find out also in Jeremiah 23 and 5 that the Messiah came out of the actual lineage of David also. Then the fulfillment of that was in John 7 and 42, where it identified identifies that Jesus was the son or in the lineage of David. Not only that, the Bible then says not only would he be of the seed of David, but he's going to have to be born in Bethlehem of Judea. According to Micah 5 and 2, it was prophesied that the Messiah will come and actually out of Bethlehem of Judea. In Luke 2 and verses 4, and in St. John 7 and verse 42, we find out that Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea. Let me side note this real quick. This is why I identified from the beginning that there is a blueprint. The word of God is the blueprint to who God is, and the word of God is the blueprint to who we are. And if we don't know who we are, we'll never be able to fulfill what God has in our life. The Bible says that Jesus waxed bold in the scripture, so he studied and found out who he was. He did not read, he did not know this osmosisly, or because when he came here, he knew he was the son of God. No, but he waxed bold and studied thoroughly the scripture. And this is why the scripture tells us the study to show ourselves approved, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightfully dividing the word of truth. We've got to study the word of God to know who we are. Back to Jesus' lineage. We find out also that not only was he born in Bethlehem of Judea, we talked about him being as a virgin, but the Bible said that there would come a time in the Old Testament, it said, where he was going to have to leave his place of birth and go into Egypt. We find that in Hosea 11 and 1, the fulfillment of that was in Matthew 2 and 15, where the Bible says that here I looked for Jesus when they heard that a Messiah was born in the land of Bethlehem of Judea, and he sent men to kill Jesus. And the Bible said that Jesus was taken into Egypt in order to be able to be, uh, go astray from them going to kill him. And this is what his parents did. Let's go to some more fulfillment that he had to do before he could even die. The Bible says that Jesus was going to become a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. In Psalms 110 and 4, we find out that Melchizedek, which was considered the king of Salem, is the person that Abraham tied it to because he realized and respected that this was a Messiah, a type of Messiah. So Abraham acknowledged Melchizedek and tied it to him. And we find out, the Bible says it like this, in the book of Hebrews, the fifth chapter, verse six, the sixth chapter, verse 20, the seventh chapter, verse 17, and the actual verse 21, that Jesus did come as a Messiah after the order of Melchizedek. Again, these are things to realize that Jesus learned by understanding the Old Testament who he was and what he had to fulfill. Now, when we hear these things, it sounds really good because look, he's here now, he's gonna be as a high priest. He's here now, he's gonna be a king, a scepter in his hand. He's here now that he was gonna be this person that was born of a virgin. It looks like miracle after miracle after miracle, he's hearing all these great things about him that he's gonna to have to fulfill. But however, the scripture says this, he would also be rejected of the Jews and the Gentiles. An entire change in the, in, the, in the order of seemingly things are working out good. This was found in the book of Psalms, verses two, I mean, chapter two, verse number one. The fulfillment was in John 6 and 66 that the Bible said Jesus was hated of men. He came unto his own, his own received him not. He was rejected 
and all these type of things that uh, fulfilled what he knew was going to take place in his life. Not only was he rejected of them, Bible said that he was going to actually have a triumphant uh, interest into Jerusalem. In other words, we find out that Jesus, <clears throat> as he got older, and he actually became the leader of these, these disciples, that he was going to be considered as a king. So he has a triumphant entry. So we find out, okay, the Bible says like this, and this was in Isaiah 62 and 11, he would have a triumphant entry. In Matthew 21, verses 1 through 10, it fulfills the triumphant ent entry of Jesus. Also in John, the 12th chapter, verses 14 through 16, Jesus has this triumphant entry into the actual, into Jerusalem on this Palm Sunday. It's a Palm Sunday right before Sunday. It should be an exciting time. But then we find out, in the Old Testament, it said, but you're good. he was going to be betrayed and not just portrayed, but it says here he would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. In Zechariah, the 11th chapter, verse number 12 and 13 shows that Jesus was going to be portrayed, betrayed by those that were as closest to him, his friends. And we do know, according to Matthew 26 and 15 and Mark 14 and 10, that's exactly what Judas did. Judas betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. This was already written in the Old Testament. So Jesus knew it was going to come to pass. He knew it was going to come to pass and he expected it. And that's what took place. The Bible says not only would he be betrayed like that, but the Bible says, Cursed is any man that die upon the cross. So now Jesus finds out and realizes that in the Old Testament, in De Deuteronomy 21, chapter number 21, verses 22 and 23, he was going to have to die on a cross because the penalty of sin is death on the cross, according to the word of God, according to the Old Testament. And we find in Galatians 3 and 13, it speaks about the death that Jesus suffered that was on the cross. We find this out in all these scriptures as we just talked today. The very first scripture that we read in John 19 and 30 identified Jesus on the cross and giving up the ghost on the cross after he said it is finished. Also, we find out uh, that he was not only going to be going to the cross, but he was also going to be wounded for our transgressions. He was going to be bruised for our iniquity. All the chastisement of our peace will be upon him, and by his stripes he we are healed. The Bible says that he was going to be wounded. This is Old Testament. So he knew that he wasn't just going to go on the cross and they crucify him, but they were going to beat him. And we find out that according to the word of God, they beat Jesus. According to Matthew 27 and 38, they beat him. They marred him. They put these crown of thorns on his head. They whipped him with his cat of nine tails, ripping off skin and bone and marrow. They were doing all these things to our Savior. And he knew that that was going to take place because it was the fulfillment of what was prophesied that he had to do in the word of God. That would have been a good time for anybody else to say, you know what? Hold it. I'm not going to do this. That's too much. And we have the nerve at times to think God is asking too much of us and to see that Jesus went through all this and all the actual things he had to deal with. And yet he did not complain one time because he already knew that this was the cost and the price for our sins. And he made sure that he fulfilled every single one of them. The Bible says not only that, but in Psalms 109, verse number 25, that they would mock him, that they would talk about him at the same time. And we do know that that's exactly what they did. In Matthew 27 and 39, they put signs out to show that Jesus, who was supposedly this, this savior, who was supposed to be this deliverer, that he was going to be uh, crucified for his insurrection and for the things that he did. And let me tell you this, Jesus did not, and he could have, but he did not and would not come down off of the cross because he realized that the thing that was actually going to free us of our sins, he had to fulfill. The Bible says this, after they finished marketing him, they would be piercing him on the side, piercing him in his hands, 
piercing them in his feet. And that is found there in Psalms 22 and 16. We find in John 20 and 27, Jesus fulfills that because he had to get pierced in his sides, pierced in his feet, pierced in his hands. He already knew that he was going to agonizingly go through all this but as far as Jesus concerned, he had to fulfill it because if he left out one of these things, he could not be the son of God. Then not only that, he realized he was going to experience a death with two male factors. Those are two criminals. The Bible says in the Old Testament that Jesus in Isaiah 53 verses uh, 9 through 12 shows that he would be numbered among those that were considered evil. Those were considered malefactors. Those that were considered criminals. In Matthew 27 verses 57 through 60, we find these two criminals on the cross and Jesus is right there in the midst of them. And yet one of them looked over and said, if you're going to save yourself, save me also. And the other one is just simply was like, Lord, remember me. And Jesus goes and looks and says to the person on the cross who was a sinner and ungodly people, this man, he says, today, you will be with me in paradise. We're going to actually page mark that, and we'll come right back to that in just a moment. Not only that, it said that Jesus was going to, he, not only that, but when he was going to experience his death, he was going to be, like I said, beaten beyond recognition. Isaiah 53 said, and they turned their faces from him. They did not even want to recognize him. They did not even want to look upon him because he was so beaten and so marred. And so when you hear about all these things about Jesus, he was doing all these things to fulfill what was written by him in the Old Testament. And that's why the Bible says they gave him vinegar and gall in Psalm 69 and 21. And Jesus realized that that is the last thing Thing that he had to fulfill before he gave up the ghost and died. And as we read today, we find out in Matthew 27, verses 57 through 60, that when Jesus drank this last or put that vinegar and gall in his mouth, because he would not swallow it, vinegar and gall represented a medicine, represented a balm, that when people would take it, it would help to heal wounds. And when Jesus tasted that with vinegar and gall, he spat it out. He did not take it in because he did not want anything to hinder him fulfilling the scripture. So that when they put that in his mouth, out of all the hundreds of scriptures that Jesus fulfilled, he realized that that was the last one before he would die. And so when we hear Jesus say, it is finished, we know that he went through all of those things for us, and he would not die. He would not allow himself to die. He did not allow himself to come down off the cross because they were mocking him. They were scorning him. They were talking about him. They were doing everything they can to get him so at a point to make him do a, a miracle and come down off the cross. But Jesus stood on that cross for us. And this is my little side note to all of us. Before you get so mad with people, before people draw you out, before you allow these things to get you so mad about what's going on in the world and what people and all these prejudices and all these unjust acts that are being done, ask yourself, are you doing what Jesus did to fulfill his life in our life? Are we doing that? Are we making sure that we're being that sacrifice for sin? Are we making sure that we are those ones who are like, I'm going to keep on living a godly life because I don't want my life to be in vain. I don't want my living to be in vain. And Jesus knew he had to do all these to fulfill the scripture. And it should inspire us that we will do everything we can to fulfill the scripture in our life because Jesus came and gave his life for us all. Now, here's the deep part. When Jesus said, it is finished, it is finished meant it was finished what I had to do on earth. What I had to do on earth, because the Bible says Jesus died. 
And I want you to know the Bible said that Jesus was going to be in the heart of the earth for three days. And let me just give you this. David said this. David had left a prophecy out there that Jesus did not finish while he was yet on the cross. When Jesus said it is finished, there was one prophecy that he knew that David had said that he had to complete. And David said, my Lord will not leave me in hell. So the Bible says it like this, and the scripture is in Hebrews, the second chapter. And the Bible says that for as much as the children were partakers of flesh and blood, he took part of the same that he might destroy him that had power over death, that is the devil, and, and deliver them who through fear of death were always subject to bondage. What that scripture is saying is this. Jesus came and put on the likeness of sinful flesh so that he could destroy the penalty of death in our life. Because in the Old Testament, when people, even though they believed on the coming Messiah, even though they were saved and they loved the Lord, they had a fear of death because no one had ever gone into the grave, had ever gone into hell and came back to talk about it. There was a fear of dying. And don't you know the very thing that causes fear of death is your uncertainty about if I'm going to be with the Lord and how this is going to take place. So they had a fear of death in the Old Testament. And their fear was because they did not know what was going to take place. But one thing that David prophesied it is that the Lord would not leave me in hell. And when people in the Old Testament that were believers when they died, they went into a place that was considered, it was called paradise. It was not the place in hell where the torments took place. Because we find out in, that there was a man whose name was Lazarus. We're not talking about the Lazarus of last week, Martha and Mary's brother. We're talking about a poor man whose name was Lazarus. And that man, Lazarus, uh, he actually went and died. And when Lazarus died, this was in Luke, the 16th chapter, when Lazarus died, he was a righteous man. Even though he was poor, he was still righteous. Side note, you can be poor and still be going to heaven. He goes and dies. And when he raises up his eyes, he is in this place of paradise. And Abraham, the same Abraham that we talked about earlier, the father of faith, is holding him in his bosom. Some people said, oh, that place is called the uh, Abraham's bosom. No, it was actually Abraham himself holding this man. There was also a rich man that died the same day that Lazarus did, the righteous poor man. And he was a rich man and he died. And the Bible said he raised his eyes up being in hell. And when he was in hell, he saw these flames that were on fire. His body was being burned. His actual body that he went into hell with was being burned. And the Bible says that this man wanted, he cries out to Abraham because here paradise is in a location that is right near the tormenting side of hell. And so Abraham calls, I mean, uh, this rich man calls over to Abraham who's actually in a peaceful place, a restful place, holding Lazarus in his arms. And the rich man who was evil during the time he lived on earth calls out and says, Abraham, have Lazarus come and get water and bring it to me to cool my tongue. But Abraham says unto this man, those that are on this side cannot come over there on your side. In other words, those that are in paradise, this place of peace and restfulness cannot come over there on that evil side where there's being torment and you're in this flame of fire because there's also a gulf. A gulf means that there is a separation. There's a huge trench. Picture yourself having two, uh, two um, areas that have been divided by a gigantic uh, earthquake 
and it's so far apart, nobody can get from one side to the other. But on this side, it is all of fires and flame, and people are being tormented. On that side, it's peaceful, love, and joy, but it's called paradise. The reason I told you the bookmark earlier, when Jesus is on that cross talking to this other thief, benefactor on the cross, that said this to Jesus, Jesus, when you enter into your kingdom, just remember me. And Jesus said, at that point, not only will I remember you, but this day, today, you're going to be with me in paradise. He was referring to that place that was way, was a cross from hell in the center of the earth. That was a cross from hell that was a peaceful place versus this place of torment. Here's what I want you to see. So Jesus had to go down. The Bible says it like this, and it's very important uh, scripture that we know this. And this, and this scripture says here uh, in Ephesians 4 and 9, the same Jesus which ascended and went up to heaven before he went and went up to heaven during those three days that he had died and he was, uh, uh, his physical body was in the earth, but his spiritual body went down into this area of hell. And hell, like I told you, think of it as having different compartments. In this one compartment, it was very much tormenting. In this other area called paradise, there was no torments. He went down into that place called paradise. And he preached to the people who were in the Old Testament looking forward to his coming. And now the very same person that they had looked forward to his coming is there. And he's preaching to them and sharing with them all the good deeds and all the good things that God has for them. And that now the Messiah that they have believed on has come and that he is there. And then what he does, he goes and takes the keys of, of hell and death away from the devil. He takes the power of it away. And Jesus begins to lead the people that were there into heaven. I want you to hear a scripture so you understand this even better. This is in uh, St. Matthew, uh, the 27th chapter. I'm going to read this to you, uh, verses number uh, 50 through 54. St. Matthew, verse, I mean, chapter 27, verses 50 through 54. And remember, I'm talking about on this thought of is more than what meets the eyes. So the Bible says, Jesus, when he cried, and when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. The Bible says this, that when Jesus went and preached the gospel to those that were those that had believed on the coming of the Messiah, had believed on him, the Bible says this, on that third day after Jesus rose from the dead, not only did he raise from the dead, but the Bible said the entire earth quaked and the rocks broke and the veil of the temple shattered. But not only that, but then the graves were open and all the saints of God, all the people who believed on Jesus as the Savior that were in that area that were dead, didn't matter how many years ago they were dead, that Bible said their graves came wide open and they got up. They did not look like zombies. So you can get that out of your mind. They did not look like their hands were falling off and their face was decayed and their rigor mortis had set in. No, they looked like they looked 
right prior to them dying and were healthy because they had to be recognized by the people they went down and told about the glorious works of Jesus Christ and that he is risen and that he is Lord. And when they came out of the grave, the people knew this much. Jesus has risen. How they knew that Jesus had fulfilled everything in the scripture and that God the Father actually was on his side and gave his stamp of approval is that not only when Jesus rose, did he also raise those that were dead in the grave also. He was saying to them, now I have all power is given unto me. And that's in, in Matthew, the 28th chapter. All power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. This is why Jesus can declare now, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? For the sting of death was sin, but thanks be to God who have now diminished and swallowed up all death, all grave, and has all victory in Jesus' name. We no longer have to fear death. We no longer have to worry about what Jesus is going to do for us because everything that he needs to do is already done. And Jesus, as he appeared, the Bible says this in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, the Bible said Jesus, not only did he appear to Cyphus, but he also appeared to the other 11 disciples. Not only did he appear to them, but he appeared to over 500 different people for almost two weeks he was being seen everywhere. See, when God shows up, he's going to show out. <laughs> when God shows up, <clears throat> he is going to show out. And all we've got to do is make sure that wherever we are, we're bringing God with us. We're bringing Jesus with us. And Jesus said it like this. He told the disciples before he even went into heaven, he said, listen, it's expedient for you that I go away. It's necessary. It's a must. I'm going to not only raise up, but I'm going to be going back into heaven. And I'm going to tell you why. He said, it's expedient for you that I go away. If I go not away, the comforter will not come. But if I depart, I'm going to send him unto you. Jesus knew that there were going to be times when we all would need comforting. And if Jesus wasn't there, the disciples would panic. The disciples would go astray. The disciples would feel hopeless. The disciples would feel like they had no other way out. But thanks be to God, how I know and how you know that Jesus made it to heaven is because he gave us his comforter, which is the Holy Spirit. Not only does it just come over us, but he dwells in us. And when you have the Holy Spirit in you and you know that he is your comforter and he is your joy and he is your peace, you don't have to worry about anything. And that tells me when I'm comforted because sometimes I don't know what I'm going to do. Sometimes I'll have things that abruptly come upon me. Sometimes I'll have situations in my life when I don't know, Lord, which way should I go? Which way should I turn? What move should I make? What role should I take? I don't know, but God, he has a way. And the Bible says, not only will he comfort me, but the Holy Spirit, Jesus got this thing so thorough, he will lead and guide me into all truth. And if we ever needed leading and guiding, we need leading and guiding in this day. I want you to know it does not matter how great this pandemic is. It does not matter how many things that we see going wrong in our government. One thing that we should know of a surety that being on Jesus' side makes it right. And if he could know every intricate part of the word of God that he had to fulfill, the hundreds and hundreds of hundreds, he also included in that there is a remnant. And the, I'll tell you, I, I'll just, excuse me, I'll get excited about this thing here. There is a remnant. And the remnant is us. He also included in this which we didn't even realize it was more than we could tell that we are that remnant that he said, I have got a people that not only am I thinking about, not only did I die for, not only did I raise up for, but I'm coming back for. 
And the Bible said that Jesus is soon to return and he's coming back for a church. He's coming back for believers, not a building, for believers that are without spot and wrinkle. And this is why we cleave to the word of God like we do, because if we will do like Jesus did and learn the word of God so that we'll understand what our purpose is and we'll find ourselves being blessed of God and he's coming back real soon. And the Bible says he's coming back in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. And it's going to be of such that every single believer will be affected by it in so much that we'll be changed just like that. And the Bible said that this mortal, this physical body is going to take on immortality. And we're going to actually, like I said, we're going to be changed just that quick. And so I was uh, employed, and I say this to you, saints of God, if we would take in and realize it's more than what meets the eyes, we'll find out that God is on our side and he has given us every provision that we need in order to please God. And Jesus is actually, like I said, he said, if I be for you, I'm more than the world against you. He not only said that, but he said, I have encamped my angels about you. Not only that, he says, they are giving you the Holy Spirit to live in you. And then God the Father says of this, I'm more than the world against you. How can we lose? God bless you. <laughs> hey, so I want to thank and praise God for each and every one of you all joining in with me today. Y'all have to excuse me. I'm about crying and everything, but you know what? I'm like this. When God has been good to you, we can only do what we can to serve him to the best of our ability. And uh, I just know that what Jesus did for us was greater than what we just talk about, the beating and the scourging. All these things were a fulfillment so that we could live a life and our life would be much more abundantly. Amen. So without any further ado, uh, at this point here, I'm going to have Minister Dion. I'm gonna have, I'll tell you what, yeah, Mr. Dion, there you go. I'm going to have you uh, uh, lead us in prayer. Uh, thank all of you all for joining on. I see my friend, Minister uh, Mitchell. I uh, uh, see uh, uh, Thomas Parker and uh, some others that have joined in with us. And we thank God for all of you, Sister Montgomery. Uh, so at this time, we'll go ahead and have that uh, closing prayer. Right. You guys like to bow your heads. Um, all right. Um, Lord, we just come before you today. And... Um, you know, it's just a, a happy resurrection day, Lord. And, uh, you know, even me and myself, I really didn't know the true meaning of, you know, the resurrection the resurrection day until today, Lord. And, um, yes, Lord. you know, it's just so amazing to see your blueprint and your word for Jesus' life. Yes. But, you know, it also shows us uh, your blueprint for us in yes. our lives as well. And it just shows how intricate and how detailed everything is. And yes. even though things may not make sense to us, you you can tell us in your word, you know, we may not understand things, but, you know, all things work together for the good to them that love God. And, yes. you know, Father, I pray that you just continue to work things out for the good in our lives and just continue to enlighten us in your word and help us to apply the word to our lives. Um, I pray that you just bless each and every one of us that heard this message today yes. and help us to be a blessing to others and um, to even, you know, help others understand what the true resurrection actually means and, yes. you know, how intricate and how detailed and how much God loves us and, um, you know, how uh, how he's always seeking us. And I would just pray that we can all seek him and continue to put him first in our lives and just uh, continue to be a reflection of Jesus each and every day. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you so very much for your prayers. Hey, happy Easter to each and every one of you all. Have a wonderful day. Do something kind and uh, enjoy, your, enjoy your week. And uh, we'll be in touch with all of you. Love you guys. Take care now. Bye-bye.